Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to our 16th webinar of 2014. Uh, my name is Jonathan Haber. I'm the Field Services Director for the California Preservation Foundation. Uh, we wanted to thank you for joining this webinar, which covers preservation technology, materials conservation, concrete, and plaster. We encourage you to become a member of CPF and enjoy the benefits and educational discounts. Information on membership can be found on our website at CaliforniaPreservation.org. The California Preservation Foundation is a membership-based, not-for-profit organization whose mission is to provide statewide leadership in education and advocacy to ensure protection of historic resources in California. The format for today's webinar will have two presenters speaking for approximately 60 to 75 minutes. We will close with a 10 to 15 minute question and answer period. Uh, for your information, there is a Q&A box on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, please type it in the box and we will hold the question until it can be addressed by a speaker. Furthermore, if you are dialed in uh, with your phone line, you are more than welcome to raise your hand and then press star six on your phone for your voice to be enabled. And you can subsequently ask your question in person for either of the speakers. During the course of the presentation, everybody will be muted other than the speakers. Um, if you'd like to ask a question but you're not connected to a microphone or dialed in, you can always type your question into the chat box, which is visible to all, all participants. You may also comment or interject if you wish through the chat box. I'm now going to introduce our two speakers for today. Carolyn Searles has 30 years of experience in investigation, design, and construction administration of building envelope repairs on both historic and contemporary structures. She, is recognized, uh, she has been recognized with the California Preservation Foundation Design Awards for her work on, on the Presidio Landmark, Griffith Observatory, Natural History Museum of Los Angeles, and the Fairmont Hotel, San Francisco. Carolyn is a fellow of the, the Association for Preservation Technology International and a past board member of CPF. She is head of SGH's Building Technology Division in San Francisco. Matthew Bronsky is associate principal with Simpson, Gumperts and Hager and SGH's nationwide practice leader for preservation technology. He has led SGH's projects on numerous mid-century modernist icons, including buildings designed by Philip Johnson, Paul Rudolph, Eero Saarinen, Joseph Louis Sert, SOM, SOM, and Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, at this point, I'm going to mute everybody who hasn't been muted, and we can begin with the presentation. I believe we're beginning with Carolyn, right? Yes. Thank you. So um, I'd like to get started, and we're going to talk about concrete and plaster today. You can see our four learning objectives up on the screen. Um, we'll talk a bit about the composition and properties of the materials, recognize signs of deterioration, learn um, repair techniques for concrete and plaster, and then learn repair techniques for repairing uncoated, integrally colored concrete and plaster. So the materials are all similar in that they're made up of binder, aggregates, and water. And the binder can be cement or lime. Um, for concrete, modern concrete, the binder is usually cement. It has fine aggregate, coarse aggregate, and mixtures in water. Cast stone um, is basically the same uh, ingredients as concrete, but it's precast into units and then put up on the building. And plaster is a mortar applied to a substrate, which could be masonry, concrete, or lath over um, sheathing or building paper, um, as a wall finish. And usually plaster is um, cement and or lime as the aggregate, as the binder, fine aggregates, and mixtures in water. So we're going to talk about the process of evaluation and repair of concrete and plaster. And here's a brief outline similar to what you would do for any um, historic building that you're working on. You want to do a thorough investigation, probably some lab testing if you're working with e um, one of those materials, concrete or plaster, um, an analysis and report. And the important thing to remember is the treatment has to be appropriate for the illness. 
So you need to find out what's the cause of the deterioration before you start selecting repairs. And then it just goes on through the rest of the design process, selecting the correct materials, doing your mock-ups, getting the right contractor, and providing some quality control during repairs. So let's first talk a bit about concrete. Um, the Romans, of course, had concrete structures, this very famous one here. And um, their concrete consisted of lime putty and pozzolan as the binder. And that's what made it hy uh, hydraulic concrete. Um, plus, they added aggregates. Um, natural cement was used in the early 1800s, um, a couple of famous structures of the Erie Canal and Brooklyn Bridge. And then Portland cement was invented and was first used widely in military fortifications in the 1880s in the US. Um, reinforced concrete came around the turn of the century. And at first, there were a whole variety of different bar types and different placement strategies. But they've now kind of evolved into the one type of rebar that you see now in reinforced concrete. So a few key properties of, uh, of concrete as a material. You can think of it basically in two ways. One is man-made stone. So you're basically making a sedimentary rock. It's very strong in compression. It's weak in tension. Um, and the reinforcement provides the tensile strength in modern concrete structures. Um, the other thing I always like to remember about concrete is I've heard it described as a hard sponge. So even though you think it doesn't absorb water, as we go through this, you'll see that it does. It, it, concrete can absorb water, and that can lead to some problems. So concrete mix, as you add um, less water to it, you, the water to cement, what we call the water to cement ratio decreases. And you end up with higher strength, um, higher density, less absorption, more durability. So all those good things. But the downside is the workability decreases. Um, so people who are placing concrete always want to add more water to it because it makes it easier to place. But that ends up with a, a poorer mix. Here's a couple examples of cast stone. Um, it's precast concrete with a fine finish coat, usually made to replicate stone or other materials. And often there's a, um, when it's placed into the molds, there's a face mix that's put in first that has the color or decorative aggregates, and then a backing mix behind it. Next, let's talk about some of the problems of concrete. Um, I've broken down the causes of deterioration into four different categories here. The first is environmental effects. So water, freeze thaw, salts either from a marine environment or de-icing salts, and biogrowth. And under that, I would put what is the most common problem that we see in concrete, which is corrosion of embedded steel. Um, and remember, we just said that concrete is a hard sponge, so it is going to absorb that water. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, inferior materials and poor workmanship. If you use a reactive aggregate that can react with the cement and the concrete, and it basically explodes. Um, other types of just poor workmanship from when the concrete is placed. Structural design defects are another cause of deterioration. And then the last one I'd say is improper maintenance. So that can be lack of maintenance that allows water to get in, or a poor choice of repair materials, such as a patch that is too hard or a non-breathable waterproof coating. And here are some signs of deterioration of concrete. Um, we have cracks in concrete. Shrinkage cracks are normal, but larger cracks can be a problem. Um, spalls and incipient spalls. <laughs> Excuse me, other stains, deflection, and erosion. Um, when you're looking for spalls or incipient spalls, you always want to tap the concrete because um, this example on the right, I was looking at this column on a building in San Francisco. It looked fine. I started tapping it. It sounds hollow. And it turned out the paint was the only thing holding the concrete in place. Um, the reason 
reinforced concrete. One of the reasons it works so well is that the reinforcing steel is protected from corrosion when the concrete is newly placed. The concrete is very alkaline. It has a pH of about 13, and it forms a passivating layer around the steel. And that layer protects the concrete from corrosion, even if there is air and water. Now, there are two reasons that corrosion occurs. One is <coughs> um, carbonation. And the other is um, chlorides that would come from maybe de-icing salts or a marine environment. Um, once either the concrete's carbonated, which is the carbon dioxide in the air soaking into the concrete, um, then it's no, the steel's no longer protected, and it's going to corrode. The same with chlorides. It no longer protects the concrete. Once the steel starts corroding, it expands, the rust product expands and causes cracking and spalling of the concrete. So methods to detect um, corroding embedded reinforcing. First, you have to know where the reinforcing is. Um, so you can find that with uh, metal detectors or ground penetrating radar. Then, as I said, we can do visual you can do sounding, and you tap the concrete to see where it sounds hollow. Um, there are two other non-destructive techniques for looking for corroded steel. One is the copper-copper sulfate half-cell testing, and the other is linear polarization testing. And you can see one of those on the, the photo on the right. Um, both those are really good at detecting um, corroded steel if it's corroding right now. If the bar has corroded, a few years ago, and it's completely gone, you're not going to be able to tell anything. So you have to understand the limitations of that test. Then if you have corroded steel, we always like to take a core um, and test the concrete for chlorides and carbonation to determine why the corrosion is occurring, because as you'll see in a minute, that's going to affect the type of repair that you choose. So let's talk about two types of repairs for corrosion of steel and concrete. <clears throat> I apologize, um, I have a cold. Excuse the coughing, please. Um, one, the first one is reactive repairs. So there you're reacting to what has happened. And the most common one is patching. So a few um, techniques for good patches, you always want to remove the concrete behind the corroded reinforcing steel all the way around the bar with enough space that you can coat the bar with an anti-corrosion coating and then go back and patch it, patch it up in layers, and then match the profile of the surrounding concrete. Um, ICRI, which is International Concrete Repair Institute, has a good um, guideline for selecting and specifying materials for repairing concrete. So that's a good reference. Now I want to talk about another type of repair, which is proactive. So here you're trying to prevent the corrosion from going on or getting worse. One of the most important ones that maybe is the easiest, one of the easier to do is to flash all your sky facing surfaces. So anytime you have a water table or cornice, which we have in a lot of historic buildings, if you can put a sheet metal flashing on that, that will keep a lot of water out of the concrete wall below and cut down on the future corrosion. Um, if you have overhanging concrete, cutting a drip edge will help get water off of that concrete. Um, clear water repellents are a good option for uh, concrete that's too absorptive, that's unpainted. And then for painted buildings, um, we have elastomeric coatings. Um, another a uh, set of treatments are chemical treatments to alter the corrosion process. And corrosion is an electrochemical process, so these treatments change that corrosion. Um, the first one is realkalization. And remember we talked about corrosion occurs when the concrete is carbonated. So realkalization attempts to raise 
the pH of the concrete back to what it was when it's fresh and new, and that protects the um, passivating layer around the steel that's been lost by carbonation. You can see a treatment and process here. Um, a electrolyte such as sodium or potassium carbonate is applied to the surface of the concrete around the temporary metal mesh, an electrical field is put through it, and during that process, the electrolyte is transported into the concrete and raises the alkalinity of the concrete. Um, chloride extraction tries to take care of the second problem that we have with that can cause corrosion, which is too much chloride. And it's a similar process, and but it extracts the chlorides out of the concrete. Um, we also have surface-applied corrosion inhibitors, which are clear treatments that will soak into the concrete and not completely stop, but reduce the future corrosion of the reinforcing steel. Another type of proactive repair we have is um, cathodic protection. And there's two types. There's impressed current, active cathodic protection, where you're running a current through the reinforcing steel. Um, that really has to be designed by a corrosion engineer. And one of the um, requirements is that all the steel has to be connected to each other for it to work, which is sometimes a problem um, if you're, well, you couldn't use it for cast stone because the rebar is not connected to each other. Um, the other type of cathodic protection is sacrificial anodes. And those have been used for years on, say, pipelines, ships, things like that. And now they're starting to be used in concrete repair. So um, this uh, example here is from uh, Vector or Sika. And they have a sacrificial anode that you just wire tie to your rebar in your patch. And that will help provide protection of that rebar because the, anode, the sacrificial anode will corrode first before the steel. OK, now let's talk a bit about plaster. Um, different kinds of plaster. Mud plaster is used, of course, on adobe. Um, lime plaster was more of an old-fashioned plaster, um, often mixed with sand and reinforced with horsehair and things like that. Gypsum plaster should be used only on the interior because it's water-soluble. And then we have exterior cement plaster, which is cement lime sand, or what we call stucco, that's so prevalent in California in our mission-style buildings. Exterior cement plaster is applied as a parge coat, often to masonry or concrete walls. Um, in multiple coats, there's usually a wide thickness variation. And what you end up with is what we call a barrier wall. So any water that hits that wall has to be repelled to the outside. Um, or it will just soak into the wall. Um, when cement plaster is applied to, uh, say, steel or wood stud construction, it usually has sheathing, building paper, or lath, and that is a modified drainage wall. So if water goes through that plaster, it hits the building paper, runs down, and out at the weep screen. So two different concepts for waterproofing. Common signs of deterioration in plaster, some are very similar to concrete, so cracking, spalling, crumbling or powdering. Um, a big problem we see in plaster is often separation from the substrate behind it, from masonry or concrete substrate, or separation between coats. Ways to detect the laminating plaster sounding is probably the best one. Um, we've also used infrared thermography. And then if you want to quantify it, there's different bond strength pull-off tests that I'll show you in a minute. Um, another thing to look at, to be aware of with delaminating plaster is falling hazards. So when we looked up at this building on the lower left and we saw a few little cracks and it looked a little bulging, we said, wait, we've got to get up there and make sure nothing's going to fall on somebody's head. It's right over the entrance. And that's the amount of plaster and concrete that came off. Um, in designing plaster repairs, you probably want to analyze the existing plaster. So remove a sample of it and develop po possible matches. Um, when you remove the sample, you'll be doing a mortar analysis, which is both uh, chemical and petrographic, to determine the proportions of cement lime sand. Um, and when matching it, it works really well to try and match the sand. So 
after you send the stuff to a lab, you should get back a bag of sand, and then you or the contractor can look at that sand and compare it to other plaster sands and try and get something similar in um, color and texture. In developing matches, you should check that against the building code. And the building code and ASTM C926 are the same. The proportions are shown below um, for different types of plaster. And there's quite a range. And if you stay within that range, you'll generally have a very durable plaster. If you go outside that range, it might be oversanded or undersanded and not perform as well. When repairing patches and plaster, um, there's a good manual from uh, Portland Cement Association, Repair of Portland Cement Plaster, and this is a sketch from that manual. So it shows how you cut back each succeeding layer, and so then the, it's keyed in to the layer below. Okay, so now I have um, three different case studies I'm going to run through and then turn it over to Matt. Um, and the first two are about plaster. The first one is Memorial Auditorium on the Stanford campus, designed by Bakewell and Brown, 1937. And it's cement plaster over reinforced concrete. Um, it's a campus landmark. And we did a building envelope assessment of it. These are some of the conditions that we saw. Um, and the reason we were called in, it was interesting, it's unusual, but we were called in just because it, the building was looking so shabby. And the university higher-ups didn't like the way the appearance of the building. It's their biggest auditorium on campus. It's an important building. So these are some of the things we saw, corrosion of form ties. Um, a lot of staining below the roof gutters, a few cracks, um, and then some really uh, stained um, garden walls. We removed some samples for laboratory testing to determine the cause of the deterioration. We did a, after we'd done our initial survey, they decided they wanted to go ahead and repair it, and there was a lot of delamination. So we did a tapping survey of 100% of the walls um, for two reasons, to remove falling hazards and then to quantify the delaminated areas so they could get a good bid from a contractor for repair. And then we discussed different repair options. And at first we thought, well, this is a choice of one or the other. We're either going to paint the whole building because it is so splotchy and looks so bad, or we'll try and patch it in place. Or maybe we could fog coat it um, to try and improve the appearance. Or replace all the plaster. And what we ended up with was eventually using all those different strategies at different places in the building, and that seemed to work really well. Um, we designed some repair mixes, had a contractor do a bunch of mock-ups until we could get the right uh, mix design. Um, dealing with client expectations for this type of repair are really a challenge. You'll hear from Matt, too, when dealing with unpainted um, concrete buildings or plaster buildings, um, it is so hard to get a perfect match of your patches. And we found in this building there, I don't know how many different colors there were, but all over the building, every patch had to be a slightly different color to match the weathered appearance of the plaster. And so here are some of our different um, mixed designs. And a patch that's a little bit dark, it may have lightened up as it cured. And then we did some, um, there was quite a bit of graffiti around the base of the building that had then been painted over. So when we saw the base of the building had been painted, we knew that, or we suspected there might be graffiti underneath. So we did a bunch of mock-ups, ended up using um, cleaning it with uh, D2, antimicrobial. Um, for the graffiti removal, um, citrus strip worked the best for removing the acrylic paint. But then we had the aerosol paint underneath, and then we used wipeout um, graffiti remover for the aerosol paint. And there were a lot of um, stains near the roof, and we determined that those were coming because uh, of a couple of things. The existing gutters um, did not drain properly. There weren't enough drains, so we did some calculations to determine how many drains they really needed to drain these big roofs. Um, and the gutters weren't properly tied into the underlayment of the roofing above. Um, in addition, um, they had replaced some of the gutters 
I believe with galvanized steel, but some of the leaders were still copper, and so we had some galvanic corrosion going on. And in the end, decided to replace all the gutters with new copper gutters. And you can see there where a bit of the tile has been removed to tie in the new gutter to the underlayment. Um, this very top molding right under the gutter uh, was painted originally. And so that really helped us out because um, we could just repaint it and get rid of all that staining down to that, uh, down at that molding. And they just had to clean and uh, patch the plaster below. So I have some before and after pictures. Um, before, you can see that there's just a bunch of different patches in the wall, different colors. And then here's the after, after it's been repatched. And I, I have to say the contractor did a really good job of matching the colors. But it was an ongoing discussion of how perfectly do the patches have to match. And the more perfect you want the elevation to look, the more of your original fabric that you're going to lose. So it was an ongoing discussion throughout the project. Well, is this, is this okay, or do we have to coat over it, or what, what do we do with this one area? The other thing we found as we went through it is that when we skim coated one area that just had so many patches, it looked terrible, so we skimmed previous patches, we skim coated it, then the adjacent weathered areas didn't look as good. And so every time we do one repair, the place next to it wouldn't look quite so good. So here's our garden walls. And at two different parts of the building, we took two different approaches. So on the left is the original, quite stained. On the right, on the top, um, that wall has been cleaned and patched. And if you look really carefully, you can see at the bottom is a slightly different color than the top of that wall. And then the after picture on the lower part, the whole wall has been skim coated with plaster. To do that, we had to have a clean, unpainted surface so the new plaster would stick. This is the theater entrance. Um, on the upper right, you can see the before. So you can just see how terrible it looked. There were just patches and paint and stuff all over it. And then um, the lower left is the after with the, the nice skim coat. Um, on the west side of the building, it was mostly cleaned and patched. So on the left is the before, um, a lot of different paint and patch colors. And then on the right, this was not skim coated. These are just individual discrete patches, and it turned out looking pretty good. OK, um, next time I want to talk about the Southwest Museum. Much easier project in some respects because the building's painted. <laughs> um, it's cast in place, reinforced concrete with a semester, cement plaster parge coat. And um, there were really three issues that we addressed. There was damage from the Northridge earthquakes. We did some structural evaluation and repairs. Um, there was water infiltration at the roofs and windows. And so we um, did that. And then there was a lot of cracking, spalling, and delamination of plaster. And so it's just the plaster I'm going to talk about today. We, um, the building had this tall tower with not really any good means of access. It's, it's hanging off the edge of a hill. And so we used industrial rope access um, to rappel down the building. Um, we tapped it and listened for a hollow sound. We mapped the cracks and delaminated areas and other damage. And then we removed cores for testing. Um, we mapped the delaminated areas on um, elevations. These are my field notes. And so you can see the extent, uh, all the cross hatching is areas that sound hollow that are delaminated and then have all the cracks on there too. And so particularly near the top of the tower, it was, it was really bad. Um, we found there were up to five layers of plaster over the concrete. And um, the plaster on the rest of the building is much better than what's on the tower. We removed core samples and did a mortar analysis and petrographic examination. Um, here's a couple of uh, micro photographs. We found that there were four to five layers of plaster. And the two layers from the inner construction um, were softer than the two outer layers of plaster. And then we found that the concrete beneath was even lower strength. So it was just the opposite of what you would, what you would want. It's an inherently problematic system. 
Um, if you were designing a building, you'd want the concrete to be the strongest and then the plaster to get weaker as it goes out, and that way the building can move without cracking. Um, but this was just the opposite. So the failures are really from defects in the original construction, plus um, a variation in moisture content over time. So there were volume changes, warping, delamination of the plaster from the concrete. Um, so we had some different problems. How much to remove and replace, compatibility of new and existing materials, matching the color texture and porosity <coughs> excuse me, of the plaster, and adhesion of the repair. Um, we did a bunch of repair mock-ups. So we had um, two test areas where we removed all the plaster from the tower and tested different mock-ups. Um, because we're thinking the tower was so bad, that's all we could do. The rest of the building was in pretty good shape. So we just had some test areas of various plaster mixes. Um, and we tested over metal lath, um, one coat, two coat, and three coat adhered plaster. And we varied the bonding agent and the surface prep and then a couple of different paints. Um, we did pull-off tests of both the plaster and the paint to see how they performed, and then we could, you know, um, compare the performance of the different mock-ups. We ended up recommending and actually implementing removing the existing plaster only on the tower. Everywhere else we could patch. On the tower, we were afraid that if we started patching in one place, it would just unzip and all the plaster would come off. Um, <clears throat> the technique was to rough and expose surface by sandblasting, apply a bonding agent, and then we ended up with a half inch thick two coat plaster system on the tower and then patching spalls on the rest of the building and painted it with a breathable elastomeric paint. And my last um, case study is a concrete building, Griffith Observatory. 1930s um, Los Angeles landmark. Um, the original design for the building was actually terracotta, so it was a pretty detailed concrete. There was a lot of uh, relief in the concrete, and the condition was pretty good. There were a few small spalls, and there were bug holes in the concrete surface, but then when you went around to the parts of the building where access was difficult, it was not as well maintained. And there were a lot of problems with the paint. It was blistering, peeling, and of course it had lead in it. This is Griffith under um, restoration and expansion. Um, they built a big uh, below grade expansion to it. And so we were, were designing the waterproofing for that and the roofs and the domes. But we're going to talk about the concrete today. So here's some of the conditions. Um, before restoration, you can see a lot of the peeling paint, some spalls, and some incipient spalls. And one interesting, one interesting problem thing about the surface was the bug holes in the surface. And the reason that's a problem is you put an elastomeric coating on it, the coating cannot bridge across those bug holes. And so water will get in each one of those little holes and then cause the paint to blister and peel. The goals of the project were to restore the building interior, um, to stop leakage to the new interior, especially on top of the expensive new observatory equipment inside, and to slow down deterioration of the concrete skin. Um, the primary things driving the repair were the historical significance, the aesthetics, and future performance of the building skin. So our concrete repair procedure was to remove the paint carefully, patch the spalls, install a sacking material, which is kind of like a really thin parge coat to fill the bug holes, and then install a breathable elastomeric coating. We probably did more mock-ups on this building than I've ever done um, because it's a, it was a really high-profile project, um, because it was a city job. All the procedures had to be established before bidding, so a lot of times we'll have a contractor the, who selected and installed the mock-up, but in this case, it all had to be established beforehand. Um, so these are the different mock-ups we constructed for paint removal, concrete repair, sacking, and painting. Um, on the paint removal, we tried different 
chemical strippers and a low pressure sandblast. The paint was so bad that where it was peeling, the hand scraping got it off easily. We didn't do high pressure water blasting because that would have been too destructive to the profile of the concrete. And we found that peel away salmon worked really well um, at all locations, and this uh, PR4 Lenox worked at some locations. So with our paint removal mock-ups, um, we did a 60 PSI sandblast, and then we did a chemical stripper. And I'll show you photos of those. And um, the low pressure sandblast really abraded the surface. And you can just see the high profile of that surface that's been abraded compared to the chemical stripper. So we didn't want to use that. Um, this is just a close up showing all the bug holes in the concrete. We tested four different sacking materials and varied the aggregate size and finishing technique, which influenced the final appearance quite a bit. So here's a couple of examples of the Sika Monotop 620 and Sika Top 121 Plus. And you can see <coughs> the very different appearance um, when it was finished. And a lot of that appearance is based on the size of the aggregate. <coughs> um, we also did mock-ups with different uh, coatings and substrates and different application techniques. Here's all our mock-ups. Um, the elastomerics were very viscous. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, Matt, this is John. Would you like to uh, take over I, from your why point? Don't carry, why don't I carry on while uh, Carolyn gets a drink of water? So the mock-ups, the elastomerics, as you can see in, in both these photos, were very viscous, meaning very thick, so it really produced a lot of stipple marks. And that wasn't desirable and didn't really uh, match with the historic appearance. So uh, what they found in the field was that by increasing the number of coats, and decreasing the thickness of the coats, and, and often what you need to do is actually thin the coating to achieve that, um, you can really decrease the, the stippling effects, as you see in that, uh, that lower photo. And spraying only is, is yet another way to reduce the, the heavy, undesirable texturing of stipples, if that was not what was there originally. Um, Manufacturers recommended back rolling, that is rolling after the spraying was done to just ensure um, that you have a good bond and, and also testing to, to verify the adhesion. So uh, there was a requirement okay, by the let city. Me, let me see. Okay, you can pick up. Yeah. Um, so the city of LA requires that their buildings um, have anti-graffiti coatings on it. And there are two types. They're sacrificial and permanent. And uh, the challenge we found is that it's hard to find any graffiti coating that will work over paint. Um, here are a couple of references for you. Um, and this was our same mock-up we had before, but we put anti-graffiti coatings on it. And then we got to have the fun of going around and putting graffiti on it to see what would come off. Um, there was concern that the graffiti would darken the paint, which it did a bit. So any kind of um, graffiti coating you put on, you always want to stop it at a natural feature or break in the wall. We tested two different sacrificial um, coatings. And the defacer eraser removed the graffiti better, but it damaged the underlying paint more. So we ended up selecting the graffiti melt. Um, we also talked about other methods to reduce graffiti, such as lighting, cameras, planting thorny bushes around the building, things like that. Where we did have falls, um, we did patch repairs. And so 
on the top photo you can see uh, a patch that's cut out with nice square cuts at the edges. The bar has been exposed. It's being coated with the anti-corrosion um, coating. And then the next one is the slurry coat that's put on. And then finally, the patch repair. Um, and what we found was that in this case, it worked better to do the patch a little bigger and then shave it back to match the texture of the concrete. So these are um, the products that were used. Um, this project was probably completed uh, a few years ago, but I think all these products are still around. And this is the final result. So now we'll turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Carolyn. So I'd like to pick up and really focus upon uh, a different genre, uh, which are the mid-century modernist concrete facades. So I think they're you know, a typology that California in particular has a really rich architectural heritage and legacy of these buildings. Um, so I'll just define the, the typology a bit, a few key points I'll cover in winding down here. Uh, discuss the problem of appreciation and vulnerability of these structures, and then uh, a bit about evaluation and repair of these typically uncoated, exposed, you know, kind of bare cast-in-place concrete buildings. So here are a few photo examples of the type I'm describing. So they were typically built in the 1960s, but really the late 50s, say 58 or so, through about 73. The facades, as well as the structure of the building, are primarily concrete, often exclusively concrete, um, often cast in place or, or sometimes a combination of cast in place and precast. And um, many modernist icons uh, are within this genre and many brutalist buildings, although not all uh, mid-century modernist concrete buildings are brutalist. And then the architects of note of this period and uh, style are Richard Neutra, of course, out in California, Paul Rudolph, uh, Aero Saarinen, uh, Joseph Louis Sert, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, Louis Kahn, and Frank Lloyd Wright. So a veritable who's who of modern architects. And perhaps the greatest uh, problem with these buildings, at least right now, is the problem of appreciation and vulnerability. So many are significantly deteriorating. A lot of the concrete is deteriorating and cracking and spalling. And many are just shy of 50 years old. So in many cases, they're not landmarked and they lack uh, protection uh, under the law or under local guidelines or ordinances. As a practical matter, they're, they're typically very difficult to adapt. The floor plans were often very tailored to the original usage. And as you can imagine, with cast-in-place concrete walls and structure, uh, the floor plan isn't easily modified. Um, and they're, as well, they're difficult for many to appreciate aesthetically. So, you know, I have here a quote from, you know, one of my clients who lived in, and did not live, but worked in, in the building at the right. Uh, you know, so I just can't see why some people consider this building architecturally significant. I think it's just ugly. Um, so there's a picture of it at the right at the time we did our study a few years ago. Um, and then the next photo shows that same photo, but it, uh, on the left, but a very early um, original photo when it was in its heyday. And so we showed them this and they really got it right away. They said, okay, now I can see why this was a significant modernist building. Um, so the you know, I think it just shows the, the owner had really done very little to this building over the years. They hadn't really messed it up or done anything negative to it, but just a couple things had really detracted, you know, seriously detracted from the appearance of the building. One was just generally soil, soiling and car exhaust. This is in a dense urban environment and it has streets on all four sides. So a lot of soot and exhaust had really just kind of minimized the contrast, the original contrast of the different colors of concrete. Um, on the right photo, the upper photo, you see the, the kind of white exposed aggregate concrete as opposed to the kind of more beige cast in place concrete. And then the, um, the contrast of the different types of windows, uh, clear um, vision glass and then translucent, which looks white in this photo, um, uh, light panels was, was kind of mitigated by the application of a re remedial reflective film. So the south and west elevations of this building, people complained that they got, they got too hot in their offices in the summer, so the owner had put up a remedial film 
uh, with squeegees just like you would, you know, on a car or something. So it was it was very easily reversible and cleaning the building um, removed the soiling very easily. But it just shows how some very little things can really detract from the appearance of, of these buildings. Uh, the design in many cases is so subtle and so refined and so restrained that little things can mean a lot over the years. So uh, another kind of broad point, you know, as Carolyn mentioned, diagnosis before intervention, as stated in the Athens Charter, is, is always an issue in preservation and always important uh, to bear in mind. But I think it's particularly important um, for concrete buildings because there are so many different illnesses or maladies that can affect concrete. And uh, to really understand what you need to do um, to address the illness, you need to understand what the illness is. So there are many different things that can go wrong um, with concrete, as Carolyn mentioned, and you can kind of organize them or chop them or slice them and dice them into many different categories. But just to kind of um, a, a, few, um, a few highlights here, uh, corrosion of the reinforcement is really the most common um, cause of deterioration in concrete. And there are many things that can cause that or accelerate it. So as Carolyn mentioned, the natural alkalinity of concrete when it's first cast provides excellent protection against the weather. But over the course of many years, a lot of things can, can really reduce that. So one is the carbonation front reaching the steel, and that's really as um, the concrete is exposed to air and, and water, um, the natural alkalinity is reduced, and so that natural alkalinity is lost. Um, another is moisture ingress, so obviously water getting into the steel uh, will cause the steel to rust. Another is high internal chlorides. So even in this period of, of the 1960s and early 70s, um, a lot of times salt or chlorides were added as a, an intentional admixture to the concrete. And in the day, um, salt was kind of the set accelerator. So it would make the concrete set up and cure more quickly. And what that really meant is that um, they could strip the forms quicker, move on to casting the next floor, et cetera. Time is money. You're building a high rise building, and that can save you a lot of money. Um, interestingly enough, uh, a set retarder in very hot weather when the concrete was setting up too fast before, you know, before they had a chance to place it was sugar. So salt and sugar, oddly, were kind of informal admixtures um, all the way into the early 1970s. And in, the, in externally applied chlorides are, can also be a problem. So on the California coast, salt spray uh, can be an issue. And in cold climates where snow is an issue, um, de-icing salts, particularly near grade and on sidewalks and walking surfaces. So external mechanisms such as impact damage or sulfate attack or um, external chloride application in the case of the de-icing salts. And internal mechanisms, uh, Carolyn mentioned alkali silica reaction, uh, which can really cause the concrete to just degrade internally very rapidly, uh, even in the absence of, of corrosion of the steel reinforcement, and freeze-thaw um, in cold climates. But I think it's actually quite a myth that um, freeze-thaw is a, is a cause of deterioration in a lot of these mid-century modernist concrete buildings. Um, I practice in Boston, and the freeze-thaw here is very severe. And I've probably studied and investigated over 20 of these buildings and only seen freeze-thaw in one or two places on one of these buildings. So it's, it's really, really pretty rare um, in this time period. It's actually very common to see cast stone early 20th century cast stone from, say, the teens or 20s that has pretty significant freeze-thaw damage. But whatever the, the illness is, the treatment has to be appropriate for that particular illness. And I think in any of these concrete repair programs, uh, you have reactive repairs, which is basically fixing what's broken, cracks and spalls, but then some sort of proactive treatment. So that's really an attempt to reduce the future rate of deterioration and you know, spend the client's money wisely and spend a little more now and slow down the future, future rate of deterioration. So the reactive are always necessary and the proactive are almost always a good value and a good idea, both in terms of um, just taking care of our historic heritage, but also in terms of um, just financial expenditure. Usually the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The penny spent now will save you a dollar later. So preventative uh, repair approaches, um, I've kind of 
classified them into three different main groups here. So those that tend to re inhibit or reduce moisture ingress, and remember moisture ingress is, is one quick way that the steel can deteriorate and, and corrode quickly. So those can be, as, as Carolyn mentioned, metal flashing caps on sky-facing surfaces such as ledges and the tops of copings, uh, a clear water repellent when you have an uncoated concrete building, or a film-forming um, opaque coating such as an elastomeric in the case of a painted building, a chemical treatment to alter the corrosion process such as realkalization or chloride extraction or a penetrating corrosion inhibitor, um, you know, all of which Carolyn mentioned, or an electrical treatment such as uh, either passive or active galvanic protection or cathodic protection. And, you know, as a kind of an aid to, to some clients and, and owners um, of I've used this slide and highlighted in blue those that involve a significant visual change if the building is not painted. So that's always important to bear in mind on an uncoated concrete building. And then those that are just much higher in their relative cost than the others. So I've highlighted those with the dollar signs. So always important to think about um, what's really wrong with the building. We know we're going to fix what's broken. And then what can we do to slow the future rate? And which of those are going to respect the original historic appearance or character and not alter it, and which are going to provide the best value in terms of dollars. So the rest I'd like to just, uh, the rest of the presentation I'd like to show through case studies. So I'll run through several different examples to show uh, different maladies that can go wrong with the concrete, even on buildings built within the same period and even buildings uh, designed by the same architect, uh, which are the first two I'll show. Um, so different things that can go wrong and different approaches you might take towards rehabilitation. So this is Peabody Terrace Graduate Student Housing in Cambridge, Mass. It was designed by Joseph Louis Sert. Um, really significant work of modern architecture. Sert actually worked for Le Corbusier as a young man in Paris, and uh, he was dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Design for many years. So a very significant figure in modernism, although almost all his work is actually uh, kind of in the Boston area with a couple exceptions, a U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, for one. And this particular complex was the winner of the AIA Honor Medal in 1965, so one of the highest honors a building can receive. And it's a complex of nine buildings, three high-rises, um, six low-rises. And so the owner began here, they had been, you know, just kind of dealing with this building on an ad hoc basis. Something went wrong, they fixed it for many years, for many decades. And by the time it came to around uh, 2006, they just seemed to have an awful lot of falling hazards, an awful lot of issues with the building, and they really wanted to kind of look at it in a more comprehensive way and start to plan for its uh, plan in a more informed way for its long-term care. So we, we took about doing a study here to really diagnose the underlying causes of deterioration and leakage on the complex, try to forecast what the future needs are, um, and then really gather a lot of data to inform um, you know, a pretty sophisticated owner and help them make more informed decisions about how they wanted to care for the complex in the years to come. And, and they were concerned with it architecturally. They knew it was a significant work of modern architecture. So they really wanted to pursue solutions that respected the original architectural character. So this will be kind of a, a hopefully quick case study showing you know, what a really detailed investigation is all about. So as you can imagine, with nine buildings, um, the high rises are about 18 to 22 stories each, and the low rises are actually three or four, but they're quite long. So they're, um, interestingly enough, they're almost exactly the size of a high, high rise that's laid down on edge. Um, so given that much concrete that was poured over a number of years as they built this complex, you know, we didn't really know ahead of time if we were going to see that most of the deterioration was driven by exposure. You know, let's say facing the ocean, which would be to the east, or the direction of the prevailing storms and wind-driven rain, which is to the northeast, or towards the river, which is to the west in this case. Um, or whether it would be, you know, kind of parts of the building where the concrete mix just wasn't quite as good. So maybe they got to a pour that was, you know, the third to fifth stories and the concrete was, was bad, and that's where a lot of the problems were. So as we started to do our initial um, study here, we're really tracking everything um, with respect to all these categories. Cardinal exposure, northeast, southwest, 
the different floors and the different pores, and then the different building elements uh, and structural elements like walls, exposed slab edges, exposed columns, shear walls, balconies, because there were differences in the detailing of each of those elements. And thus the propensity to have the steel either close to the surface or have it uh, deeper within the wall was, was different. So we didn't really know how this was going to shake out, but we thought, you know, we'd better kind of look at all these things and kind of sort all our data by all these categories. So the evaluation was really kind of putting together a lot of different pieces of a puzzle and picking up on a lot of things that, that Carolyn previously mentioned, like uh, cores, petrographic analysis, uh, various types of non-destructive testing, good old-fashioned hands-on survey, um, binocular survey. So as you can imagine, with nine nine very large buildings, we couldn't physically touch every square foot of every surface. So putting the binocular and the hands-on together and uh, a lot of different types of testing. And then really trying to bring it all together and synthesize um, and analyze the, the data that we gathered to make sense of it. So the hands-on survey, that was you know, really getting up there on lifts or on swing stage and even doing some of this from balcony, sounding, as, as Carolyn mentioned, and you know, looking for delaminated areas or concealed damage. On balconies or other horizontal surfaces such as decks, what works really well is dragging a chain as opposed to tapping a hammer. And that's what you see in the um, second photo from the top on the right, dragging a chain across all these balconies. And with any sort of sounding, what you hear is you hear a very different sound when you go over an area that's, that's delaminated. That is that beneath the, sur on the surface, it looks fine, but beneath the surface, it's no longer bonded to, to kind of the deeper parent concrete or stucco. And you tend to get kind of a hollow sound over those, those different areas. So doing that type of um, survey and keeping track in, in kind of spreadsheets, as you see at the bottom, sorting by cardinal direction and by all our different um, structural categories and exposures and heights where we're finding the existing damage. Um, in situ testing, and we mentioned ground penetrating radar, which is really looking at, okay, beneath the surface, how deep is the steel? Knowing that corrosion of the embedded steel is often a big issue in these buildings. And the closer it is to the surface, the more vulnerable it is to corrosion from all those different mechanisms that we both mentioned, um, carbonation front reaching the steel, moisture ingress, external chlorides, et cetera. Um, and then other non-destructive metho testing methods, such as uh, measuring corrosion activity, which you can do with uh, galvanostatic pulse. Uh, Caroline, Caroline mentioned half cell, uh, half cell potential testing and linear polarization as well. And then these kind of plots or maps show areas of um, low corrosion activity, uh, which are green, um, kind of moderate, which are yellow, and then the hot spots where a lot of corrosion is currently occurring, which are red. And these are essential, essentially like elevation maps of different er areas of the facade. Uh, water testing, leakage was an issue on these buildings. Um, so we did institute testing uh, of different areas that were known to have leaks and damage, like you see on the right photo figure out where is that water really coming from? Is it coming directly through the concrete? Is it coming through the windows? Or you know, is it perhaps coming through the, the interface between concrete and windows? And is it coming through, if it's coming through the concrete, is it through the field or is it where um, different elements meet like precast panels where they meet uh, cast in place slabs? And taking cores of course and analyzing them um, in our petrographic lab. So looking at, and what what really uh, we're doing or, and our petrographers are doing in analyzing these cores is looking at um, all the constituent ingredients in the concrete, everything about how it, was, how it was made. So how much water was in the mix originally. Carolyn mentioned the importance of water cement ratio to just about everything, to strength, to absorption, to long-term durability, et cetera. So what, what is the water cement ratio? Was it air entrained, which helps uh, minimize freeze thaw damage? Um, are there high chlorides in it? How deep is the carbonation from the surface? So all those things relating to potential maladies, we can really measure um, by examining the cores in detail. And in this particular case, you know, long story short, really it was pretty good concrete. Um, everything that we were looking for was, you know, maybe not ideal for 2014, but it was really pretty good and, and quite good, in fact, for the 1960s. 
So, you know, the challenging part on, a, on an investigation this large is putting together all the different pieces and, you know, assimilating them. So, you know, corrosion activity, uh, all the hands-on sounding to figure out what's really going on with the building, what the prognosis is for the future. Is the deterioration going to kind of continue the way it's been going at, the, at similar rates, or is it, is it going to accelerate? Are they kind of at the tip of an iceberg right now in terms of, um, a deterioration mechanism like carbonation front reaching the steel and we're really where's the best value for the owner in terms of um, not only repairing what's what's wrong today but in terms of minimizing or reducing the future rate of deterioration and I think one of the ways that on this project that really best enabled us to put all the pieces together we're doing these histograms so what these vertical bar graphs show and we did, you can see this one at the top is labeled Building Z, one of the nine buildings. South elevation, again, the cardinal orientations. Slab edge at walls, different structural elements. So on all these different kind of buckets that we're sorting by, building, elevation, um, structural component, height, um, we did one of these. And so what the blue bar graphs are showing is the cover on the steel. So how, how deep beneath the surface is the steel um, and that was done through the non-destructive GPR testing. That um, solid line is from the petrographic testing, and that's a, where is the carbonation front today? Because we know once the carbonation front reaches the depth of the steel, deterioration, steel corrosion occurs very rapidly. Um, and the good news here is you can see we really had not reached the depth of the steel on these elements on this building. And kind of a cross-check was the amount of damage we're seeing should really be how much of the blue bar graph is to the left of that solid black line. And here it was essentially none. And you know what we're finding in the field with the hands-on and binocular survey was essentially you know there was no damage on building to Z at the slab edges on the south. So that was all aligning and we were getting some confidence in you know the way we were pursuing this. And as we get into some other elements and some different buildings, you can see the, the picture wasn't quite so rosy. So here the blue bar graphs to the left of the black line should be um, damage such as spalls and falling hazards on the existing facades and that was that was true we were getting a you know a small number of those on building Z away from the reveals on the south elevation the dash line was actually a, a predictive calculation we did of okay if we know that the the, the, um, the way the carbonation depth progresses into concrete is nonlinear so it's not a fraction of an inch per, per year forever. But the deeper it gets, the more it slows. So it's actually a function of the square root of time. And there's an equation for that. I've cited it at the lower left from A.M. AM Neville's Properties of Concrete, which is a, a really great technical reference. And it's D of depth of carbonation equals a, a, co, a constant K um, square root of T. I've written it here as, as T to the 1 half. Um, so we know the equation, and by measuring where it is today and knowing the age of the building, um, you know, which is almost 50 years, we can calculate that, that constant K. And then knowing that constant K, we can really plug in any time T and find out where will the carbonation be in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. So you know, having that measure, we're able to, to really accurately predict where the, where the carbonation will be in the future. And so what that really does for us is by pushing that solid black line out to the right, it tells us, you know, how much more of the steel is, is the carbonation front going to reach if we do nothing in, say, 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. So this is looking at 30 years out. We're actually going to hit, you know, a fair bit more of the steel. And then we can measure that difference with the red lines and see, you know, how many repairs are we likely going to get into. So that's kind of the predictive nature of what we're doing with these histograms. And so yet another area, different area, same building, the walls at the reveals, you know, the, the existing damage, which is all the blue to the left of the, of the black vertical line is, is much worse. And that, that correlated exactly with what we saw out there. And the amount that they're going to get into in the next 30 years is more significant. So you get the idea. So even within a single complex built all at the same period, uh, and with concrete that was very, very consistent in quality, um, issues like the, uh, the depth of the steel um, beneath the surface, which is what we call concrete cover, 
um, is really going to affect significantly how much damage you have and how much you'll be looking at in the years ahead as, as things like carbonation progress. So that's the st that was the story really at Peabody Terrace, is the concrete was good quality and really the big malady or big problem with the concrete was the carbonation front reaching the steel where the steel happened to be close to the surface. So that's what those histograms happened, you really showed us. And they also showed us, you know, if we're going to go for a more expensive treatment, um, like realkalization, you know, you don't necessarily have to do it on every, every surface of, of all nine of these buildings. Here's where you should really focus your effort in a limited budget. So we're able to tell the owner, these are the areas that we'd really like to do even with a limited budget. Um, and those areas happen to be the reveals of the walls and the balcony slabs. So those were the two real areas where, where they should really focus the most effort they can uh, towards preventative maintenance. And uh, interestingly enough, leakage through the sealant joints, not through the concrete itself, was really the primary leakage path on this building. So the solution to leakage here, you know, thankfully they didn't need to coat this building with an elastomeric coating because um, it, it had always been uh, exposed concrete, and that was really an important part of its, of its character. Um, but they really needed to replace the sealant joints. And what we did here was replace a single stage or a single line of sealant joint with dual sealant joints that were wept. So that added a lot of reliability. So I, I just mentioned those uh, in advance. And the, the, the very expensive but um, you know, potentially worthwhile additional thing that we, we considered doing was the realkalization re of balcony decks. And we did recommend uh, another preventative treatment, corrosion inhibitor, everywhere. It was so inexpensive and uh, we thought would provide so much value that they should really do that everywhere. But the additional expense of realkalization made sense at the balcony decks. And coating the top side of the balcony decks, which had always been coated, um, would you know, further limit moisture ingress. So we mocked up realkalization. We had, you can see them doing it here on a balcony. And um, we, you know, we tested, cut cores and tested the alkalinity of the concrete before and after this treatment just to prove to ourselves that they could really do this effectively and to measure how effective it would be. Uh, oftentimes, it's kind of specialty work. Only specialty contractors do this. There are just a few in North America uh, that I know of that, that do this, this type of work. Uh, but oftentimes they'll they'll do a pH check afterwards and they'll tell you if the pH is nine or more, and if it's nine or more, they'll call it good. Uh, but we thought it was really important to see exactly what the pH was. Um, so with a different type of um, phenothalene indicator, which is essentially you know kind of like a litmus paper that will tell you what the pH is, we were able to pin down that the pH after treatment was actually 11 to 13. And the plot that you see at the lower left, means um, that, was, that was really a good finding because you can see uh, what's being plotted on the vertical axis is corrosion activity. So at 10, um, this is really, the corrosion activity is still pretty high. And if you can get down to 11, the corrosion activity is just a fraction of what it was uh, at 10. And if you can get down to 12, you're, you're even better. So down to 11 to 13, you're in kind of the flat range of that curve and the corrosion activity is very low. So we found it to be very, very effective and proved it out, uh, but it became, it became a kind of a logistical problem to do it on this building where it was fully occupied because the secondary egress on these buildings is actually out the balcony. Um, so it became kind of a life safety issue to take the balconies offline. And something that we really spent a lot of time on here uh, was developing uh, concrete repair mixes, custom mixes, to match the existing concrete. So what you see in both these lower photos are just a lot of different little mock-ups, about eight inches square or so, trying different mixes to really get close to the color of the concrete that's there. And on all of these in the cast-in-place concrete, uh, we didn't use any pigment or dyes. So uh, Carolyn mentioned the importance of sand in uh, matching historic plaster or cement stucco. Same thing with concrete. It's really critically important to match the sand uh, to get that right. And the little graph that I'm showing at the upper right shows some typical mix designs uh, for concrete. And the, um, the coarse aggregate is kind of the bright orange at the far right. And the fine aggregate, meaning the sand, is the lighter orange dot. So the aggregate 
in total, fine and coarse, really is typically about two thirds or three quarters of the mix. And so the problem with pigments or dyes is what you're tinting, you're not tinting the sand and you're not tinting the, the coarse aggregate, you're just tinting the paste. Um, and when repairs are typically installed with a t steel trowel, the paste floats to the surface. So on day one, you're seeing what's basically a third to a quarter of the mix, and that's where your pigment is. And then when people talk about kind of color migration uh, over time of patches, you often hear that with stone repair patches or anything that's tinted, uh, often what's not happening is the color isn't really migrating, but uh, the paste is weathering away because it's, it's softer than the, than the sand or aggregate, and you're exposing more and more of the sand or coarse aggregate, and the sand and coarse aggregate have their own color. So that color is coming to the fore. So when the, when the patch becomes as weathered as the building, essentially you'll be seeing about three quarters of aggregate and only about a quarter of paste, whereas on day one you're seeing all paste. So that's, that's the problem we're trying to avoid here. So we spent a lot of effort trying to, and on all these projects, a lot of effort matching the sand color, and then also looking at fractured surfaces of the concrete to see what color the cement was originally. Um, so for instance, the, this is a chunk of concrete from this very building uh, designed by Joseph Louis Sert. Here's an, another chunk of concrete from a building of his right up the street built concurrently and you can see how different they look. So it's really important to look at each building individually uh, and also the fractured surface on the back is good because it can give you a good look at what the color of the paste was. Um, you know, was it a, a white paste? Was it a gray paste originally? Um, and if it was gray, how dark was it? What we've found is, um, you know, different manufacturers' gray cements really vary a lot in how light or how dark gray they are. Some are very, very light gray. Some are a very dark, almost uh, charcoal gray. And uh, one in particular is, is kind of a light, almost buff. You know, it's almost more beige than gray. So you really have to be particular, not just gray or white, about which, um, which cement you're using to try to come close to the color of the cement that was, that was there originally. So matching all the individual ingredients, uh, cement, sand, coarse aggregate, as closely as possible, and really, I think the key thing is going for the best long-term match. So accepting that you're not going for the best match on day one, and you're going to abrade that and try to expose some of the aggregate, but it's going to come in um, to its full color in a, in a, you know, over a period of several years and um, not on day one. So that's, that's really what the goal should be. And by matching the constituent ingredients as closely as possible, um, that's the best way to achieve the, the best long-term match. So here are some of these patches going in with our final mix selection uh, at Peabody Terrace. And what we went with here was a really stiff um, mix. And, and Carolyn mentioned all the good things about having a low water cement ratio. So not having a lot of water and having a very stiff mix that's maybe more like the aggregate of, maybe more like the consistency of, um, of peanut butter as opposed to the consistency of sour cream, uh, for lack of better examples, you know, that actually has to really get packed in with a, a, a lot of elbow grease with a hand trowel to pack that into place. So almost, almost the consistency of like a sandcastle sand um, going into the wall. Then that shaved level with a metal trowel uh, was moist cured with a burling, which is plastic on one side and burlap on the other side. Uh, the burlap is wetted to help keep the, the patch moist. And then after it's cured for you know at least 10 days, the longer the better, um, sandblasted, and in some cases where the sandblaster was uh, impractical, where it was too high or windy, we allowed them to use a needle scaler, which worked pretty well. So texturing that, and the texturing part is really just, um, it's not just creating the texture, but it's also exposing some of the sand. So there you can see a completed patch on the lower right photo that hasn't been washed yet, so it still has some dust around the perimeter, but pretty good color that should only get better with time. So I spent the most time on that one, but we'll roll through the others uh, pretty quickly. So example number two, same architect, uh, Joseph Louis Surt, same time period, 62 to 65, and right up the street in Cambridge. Um, so the concrete was very, very similar quality, um, but this building has far fewer spalls. Um, they, 
not nearly as many spalls, and they haven't had nearly as many issues with falling hazards from this building. And they were just wondering why, you know, what's the story? And so is it, was it a better quality concrete? Um, and the answer from all our petrography was no, it's very, very similar concrete, you know, almost identical. And really the reason here was better cover. So that is, they don't have many bars that are very close to the surface on this building as they did at Peabody Terrace. And that was the biggest difference. Um, so the recommendations here, and this is a current project, we did the study a few years ago and we're right now in early design phases and doing a lot of mock-ups, uh, as you just saw. Technical was very similar, um, and aesthetic. Uh, we said it was really important to clean this building uh, for the reasons I showed previously. This was the one that just with, um, with slight differences from the uh, soiling of the concrete and replying, applying the remedial film to the windows, the building had lost a lot of its character. So it's uh, repairing the concrete, taking some proactive measures like a, a mitigating uh, corrosion inhibitor applied to the surface, and then doing some, uh, some work to the windows to restore their character, uh, particularly removing those reflective films. This is yet a third building, same architect, uh, just across the river, you know, about a mile and a half away. So same environment, and uh, also right on the river, like, like Peabody Terrace, and just built kind of at the beginning of the start of construction of those previous two buildings. So a little bit, completed a little bit earlier. Um, cast in place walls, and this building has much more, um, much more precast introduced as a design element than PBD Terrace. The fins, the sills, panels and scuppers are all precast exposed aggregate concrete, whereas the majority of the facade is cast in place. Um, so story here was again, the concrete was really pretty good. Um, no signs of internal distress like alkali silica reaction, no freeze thaw damage at all. Um, and the primary deterioration mechanisms were actually different on the cast in place than on the precast, which you know makes sense. They're 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 kind of built differently and they're they're built in different places and with different processes. So the cast in place concrete, like Peabody, the story was really the carbonation front reaching the reinforcement. But on the precast concrete, um, they actually had very high chloride concentrations in some elements, but not all of them. And that was, again, the set accelerator being introduced um, when they really wanted to, you know, improve the pace and when it wasn't, wasn't so hot that the concrete was curing uh, quite rapidly on its own. So some of these elements had really high chlorides, and, and once water did get into them, um, you know, then the chlorides go into solution, and then the corrosion of the steel really... Uh, advances rapidly at that state. And kind of a third big issue on this building was the sky facing surfaces. So those ledges and sills, tops of copings, um, had really significant moisture ingress and carbonation and spall damage as a result. And that was much more true than on the previous two buildings. So here, um, you know, kind of similar recommendations in, in some ways on the cast in place, the penetrating corrosion inhibitor, with some additional treatments. So uh, all the precast elements were going to get a clear water repellent because moisture ingress and high chlorides were such an issue on those. And all the sky facing surfaces, and this job is currently in construction, uh, nearing, com nearing completion, uh, we're getting treatment to, uh, to mitigate moisture ingress. This is just kind of an example of, of the due diligence that um, you need to go through in doing mock-ups. So these are some of the Excel tables we did of all the different mixed designs that we mocked up to, to do what you see here. And so I think a really good way to do these is find an out-of-the-way place, often like a rooftop penthouse or elevator penthouse, uh, or sometimes a loading dock or an area like that, where you can cut a bu bunch of little squares, say six inch square or eight inch square in the wall, and um, try out different mix designs. So the previous table showed just you know a, a gray Portland cement, a white Portland cement, a buff colored or light gray Portland cement, and a bunch of different sands. You know all of which we think are going to be good candidates, but you really have to try them to find out. And I think the other interesting thing this shows is if you look at the um, is is allowing the the samples to cure and have the time to come into color. So the top photo was essentially right, right after they were done. That was August 2013. The bottom photo was just a month later. So with only a month of time passed, you can see how much um, the color has changed. 
and even how much the, the kind of halo around each of these, which was from the abrasion, has started to fade. Um, so the earlier you can do these and the longer you can let them weather, uh, I think the better, better you'll be able to select the right mix design for a building. And sometimes, as, on, as was on the case on the, the law tower, uh, we're able to go with one mix design for the entire building. The cast in place was that consistent in color. On Peabody Terrace, um, we had six different mix designs, and we, we chose them as we ran around that complex of nine buildings, because with, with nine buildings and all those different exposures and something that was constructed over that long a period, the, um, the concrete did vary that much in color that we needed to have several different uh, choices up our sleeve at every area. So a uh, fourth example is Morrison Stiles Colleges at, in New Haven at Yale, designed by Saarinen. Um, this one, very unusual in that it has these very large boulders. They may be the size of like cantaloupes um, in the surface of the concrete. So you can see them in that lower left photo. And this was essentially, um, you know, kind of a modernist idea of being contextual to the older stone, uh, historic stone buildings at Yale. So we use those large boulders as the coarse aggregate. Now, this building, the, the concrete itself was actually worse. Um, according to all our petrography, the chloride content, the air entrainment, the water cement ratio, than the three buildings I just showed. But the concrete is in much better shape. So how could that be? We have worse concrete, but this building is far and away in much better condition, far fewer spalls or cracks than any of the buildings I've just shown. And really, the answer was cover. So to accommodate the thickness of those, those big cantaloupe-like stones, uh, the steel was set way back from the surface. So the typical cover that would be specified uh, on these buildings was inch and a half or two inches. And, um, and sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't as things shift around during construction. Uh, sometimes on those previous buildings, we had three quarters of an inch or half an inch, and that was often where the problems are. Here, he set the cover at five to six inches. And um, he really got it because the boulders were kind of there to keep the bars from getting pushed around or pushed toward the surface. So that's really why this building is in so much better shape than its, its sisters. So the, um, the recommendations here were this building's in great shape. Uh, the couple things that are vulnerable, why don't we you know, take some inexpensive measures now to uh, preventative measures to protect them and, and keep keep that true. So cap the sky facing surfaces. So some of these surfaces you see at the lower left, there's a kind of a projecting you know modern window head uh, in concrete. Some of those surfaces were capped and some were not. He originally had a lead coated copper flashing that capped some but not all of those. And we said you know the vocabulary and the materials are already there. Why don't we carry it around and finish those? Because that's the point you're you're really most vulnerable and where water could get back to that five to six inch depth of steel most easily. And here we didn't even need to bother really with the corrosion penetrating inhibitor. Um, five to six inches deep, it really wouldn't have um, reached the depth of the steel and thus it wouldn't have provided any value. The fifth uh, very quick example is a really unusual structure. This is the Miami Marine Stadium. Uh, you might have seen it in the news in the past few years. It was on the uh, the most endangered list for the National Trust and the watch list of the World Monuments Fund. Uh, so a 1964 structure, um, it was designed as a kind of a spectator uh, stadium for powerboat racing, which was a big sport in Miami in the early 60s. Really structurally daring, 64-foot uh, free-spanning non-trust cantilever we think might be one of the largest, if not the largest, in North America. Kind of a rare usage and type. Uh, and a long cultural history that included the filming of the Elvis film Clambake. You'll glimpse it if you, uh, if you get that film on DVD and take a look. Uh, so a very interesting structure. And you can see in that top, those top photos, about a third of it is actually built into salt water. So this structure sits in salt water uh, in Miami, in the bay down in Miami. So you can imagine that's a pretty hostile environment for reinforced concrete. We talked about how salts are harmful. Uh, so this structure was, um, you know, sitting in a very harsh environment, and then it was abandoned and neglected for about 20 years. So a bad combination. 
So it was really in poor condition overall, except for the roof. And that's kind of surprising because usually when you get into a very thin concrete element, uh, and the roof here is a particularly thin, thin shell concrete structure, uh, it means you have less cover on the reinforcement. So the reinforcement's close to the surface and uh, thus more vulnerable to corrosion. Um, but what, what really saved the roof structure is they knew the roof was going to be thin, the cover would be minimal, and it would be vulnerable. So they actually specified galvanized reinforcing in the roof only, but nowhere else in the structure. And this structure, and actually the Holyoke Center, where they specified galvanized reinforcing in the very thin fins, um, which, are, which are in great condition today on, on where, they, where they remain, um, has really made me a believer in, in the, the power <laughs> and the longevity of galvanized reinforcing. So as you can imagine, the real problem with this structure was high chlorides really everywhere but particularly the top side of the deck where the, the um, salt spray would kind of land and be dissipated. And that was actually made worse during the years when this was an abandoned structure. It was used as target practice by the fireboats uh, for the city police department. So um, not, a, not a great idea in retrospect. So here we gave them, obviously, you know, as always, they had to repair all the damage that existed, and we gave them multiple preventative options. Uh, for the different surfaces. So uh, uh, coating on the top side of the roof and on the top side of the deck, which you know kind of works hand in hand with bringing this back to be a functioning stadium. Um, stadium deck coatings are pretty common and just help with routine maintenance. Uh, no coatings on the underside to allow any moisture that does pass through that coating on the top side to, to get out, uh, dry out, and uh, breathe, and a penetrating corrosion inhibitor throughout. So just to wrap up, uh, a few of my key takeaways here uh, are really that these mid-century modernist concrete structures are particularly vulnerable historic resources. Uh, they're often very significant works of modernism, but they lack protection. Um, and they're in jeopardy both because of deterioration, falling hazards, and, and uh, problems, public safety problems, but also because they're inflexible to modify and adapt. Uh, but they're particularly important and they're really worth saving. They're an important part of our architectural heritage. Uh, and so in terms of evaluation and repair, thorough analysis before intervention, you know, as the Athens Charter told us way back in 1931 for historic buildings and monuments is particularly needed on these. And that involves looking at these buildings in a lot of different ways and putting together a lot of pieces of data to really understand the whole picture of what's wrong with them and how best to preserve them. And that the treatment, or more often the various treatments that we prescribe for different parts of these buildings, really need to be appropriate to the particular malady. Um, and that often varies within an individual building. So um, Carolyn and I would like to thank you and would love to take any questions you have. Thank you, Matt. Um, we do have uh, at least one question in already from Peter, and he's asking how do you determine the presence of chlorides? Uh, he's wondering if it's petrography or some similar alternative method. Yeah, it's actually a pretty simple test uh, in, the, in the lab. So it's petrography, and um, we often do it at three different depths within a core. And the, really the reason to do it at different depths is if we're doing it near surface, um, a little deeper and very deep. Um, often we'll see that it's higher at the surface and lower internally, or vice versa. Uh, it's higher internally and lower at the surface. And that's an important indicator of whether, uh, if there are high chlorides, if they were originally part of the mix, you know, they were intentionally put into the concrete as, a, as an admixture and set accelerator, or, you know, if they were externally deposited, such as by salt spray, or by de-icing salts. Great. Um, do we have any further questions? I think I have at least one from the Q&A box. And um, the question was about realkalization uh, re and how long uh, it lasts, or how long um, will it have a lifetime uh, before it needs to be retreated? Yeah, according to the test data and literature, it's theoretically permanent. Um, you know, I'm always a little skeptical when I hear permanent or forever, um, but it hasn't been out there long enough to prove that out. Um, so 
it, it seems like the, the really early works that were done in this country were on infrastructure. They were on bridges and not buildings. And those still seem to be doing well, you know, in terms of the, the data that the contractors who did them have gone back and, and gotten and kind of checking on those. Um, the building history isn't nearly as long. It seems like it, it only, um, only became really, you know, uh, somewhat common within the past 10 years or so. So it, it doesn't necessarily have the track record to prove that it's forever. Um, but the, the test data really looks good. And they, they don't, uh, the people that do this and, and those who have kind of written and theorized it on the academic side don't say it, it needs to be reapplied or redone. Okay, I don't know if you just saw the other question that came in, but it's from Robert, and he's asking if you have any problems uh, with chemicals left in the concrete from paint remover. Let's see, Carol, and uh, um, do you want to take that one? Sure. I haven't seen any problems like that, um, but any paint remover, even the peel away things like that that you use, you have to uh, power wash it off when you're done, and you can even test the pH and make sure that you get back to a neutral pH. I think that would be the um, problem you might have if you had one, is using a very alkaline paint stripper or either alkaline or acid, and then you're not getting back to a neutral pH, and that might adversely affect a new coating that you wanted to put on. Great. So last call for any questions. If anybody has them, please uh, type them in the comment box. Um, and if we don't have any further questions, I'm looking at the comment box right now. I don't see any coming in. I wanted to thank both of our speakers and also move over to the evaluation uh, section of this session. Um, this is where you can um, comment and let us know uh, what you'd like to see in the programs, uh, what you're looking for. Um, uh, please fill out this uh, multiple response on the far left-hand side. There's nine questions, but then once you're done with the ninth question, scroll up to the top of the page and hit Submit Response. And if you have any written responses, whether you have comments about the session itself or you'd like to see other topics taken up in future workshops or webinars, um, please type them in the right-hand boxes. Um, and of course, uh, on the top of the page is the sign-in sheet for today's session. If you uh, are part of a group of people sitting in a conference room, we ask that you send us the sign-in sheet so we can get your credits, uh, continuing education credits. And um, we have a schedule for upcoming workshops and webinars at news.californiapreservation.org slash events. So thanks again to both of our speakers today. A wonderful presentation. I'm also going to encourage you to register for the second part of this two-part series on preservation technology. And this uh, second part will cover energy efficiency and historic preservation. And that will occur on um, Tuesday, September 30th at 12 noon. Um, so please sign up for that one. And other than that, I uh, hope you have the rest, of, a wonderful rest of the day. And please have a great rest of the afternoon. And please continue to support the California Preservation Foundation. Thanks again, everybody. Bye.